All right, let's try to imagine this if, if possible, okay? We tend to think of things in the modern sense, okay? Here we are back in the first century. We're the church of, at Corinth. But we're not the first Baptist church of Albuquerque, New Mexico. In fact, Christianity is a new thing. You know, to us, it's not. To them, it was. You know, the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And so here are these believers there at Corinth. The first century church being primarily Jew Jewish, uh, some Greeks, a few Gentiles, but primarily Jewish. And at this church in Corinth, there is something taking place that's quite different than, in one sense, quite a whole lot different, really, in one sense than what uh, you, we might see happening today in churches today. But then in another sense, not so different. It's commonly reported. It's it's openly talked about. It's it's commonly known. It's you know we might use the word gossip. That this man has his father's wife, and they haven't mourned over this. They haven't become sorrowful over this. It's become perhaps even as acceptable, the norm. First Corinthians chapter five is a big chapter in, in most of modern Christianity, in mainstream Christianity. Uh, as far as you know, it's the excommunication chapter. You know, kick the guy out. We talked about verse five, uh, delivered over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, in order that his spirit may be saved in the day of Christ Jesus. And I, we, we looked at that in previous uh, videos. And I suggested that we were looking at a situation in which this was something that God did. Delivered this man over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh. It wasn't Paul. It wasn't the church. Even though Paul may have had the authority, the apostles may have had the authority I suggested that it was the Holy Spirit that did this. And certainly, we don't go around delivering people unto Satan for the destruction of their flesh. I think if we were to go down that path, we would, you know, one another, we'd be delivering one another over to Satan for the destruction of their flesh, and pretty soon everybody, everybody you know would be delivered over to Satan for the destruction of their flesh. I think we're looking at something spiritual occurring in inside the life of that Christian. It's not as some as much something external that's occurring within the church at Corinth. And I talked a little bit about what I thought that destruction of the flesh meant. That it it wasn't primarily First and foremost, at least in my opinion, it wasn't the destruction of the physical flesh, but the works of the flesh. The old man delivered over to Satan for the destruction of the old man. Where the, this individual comes to the end of themselves, and I even talked a little bit about maybe, you know, I brought in the idea of the prodigal son off in the far country. You could say that's delivered over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, or that the individual comes to realize it's, it's, it's far, far better back in his father's house. 
and also suggested that we had verse 13 coming up, which was an entirely different situation, and that verse 5 and verse 13 were not the same occurrences. It was not speaking about the same thing. So we're getting ready to close out the fifth chapter of 1 Corinthians. I, I want to take a moment to thank all of you for who have participated with us in this study as we feasted on the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is what we're going to really discuss more heavily in this part 22, I believe, of, of this series of studies in 1 Corinthians. I think it's, it does us well to remember that the church at Corinth, these were God's people, this was God's church. The text clearly says it was God's church. This was not a group of people who got together and decided that they were going to have a church. And what is most important to remember is all of the grace and the love that we see that God poured out upon these believers at Corinth in the chapters that preceded this. Personally, I'm, I'm of the mind that we can't open this book to any page of it and not see the love and the grace of God. I don't care what story, what passage, what verse, what chapter, what verse, what illustration, what circumstance. But the common tendency, I think, among most Bible students, most Christians, especially today, is to, to come across passages which seem to contradict that. You know, we see so much love and grace in one verse, and then we go read on, we continue reading on, and now all of a sudden we seem to be hit with this wrecking ball, you know, of, of something that appears to, to, to contradict all of that, where, where it appears God is mad at us, that, that there's judgment involved, and, and so there's no consistency in all of that. So anyway, this is, is somewhat, I guess you might say, of, I might, might, you might call this a, somewhat of, a, of an introduction to our continued uh, study in 1 Corinthians, uh, where that I, I believe, at least I, it's my hope, that we'll close out the fifth chapter uh, in this video, and we'll move on to the sixth chapter. So... Before we begin, let's have a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence once again by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. Thankful for the opportunity that you give us to, to study your word together, to feast upon it. We so realize our limitations. We so rely on you as our one teacher to enlighten our minds, our hearts, to filter out all of that which is not of you, which is nonsense, but just seal to our hearts that which is truth, that we might grow in grace and knowledge of you. In Christ's name I pray, amen. So in our last study together, we'd reached the ninth verse of chapter 5. And in a very real sense, it's the culmination of that which we've been taught in the first four chapters of the greatness of God, uh, the love of God. And it's the basis for all of the rest of the epistle. There's open sin. Uh, Commonly well known, everybody knows it in the church at Corinth. 
and that sin has a leavening process. So, uh, well, I mean, you know, but, you know, so what? I mean, it's just one more sin, right? Christ forgave us of all our sins. Christ forgave all our sins. What's one more? And so people become casual about sin. You know, it's, it's easy to be casual about sin. And there didn't seem to be any real concern, not any real genuine concern at this early church in, in Corinth over that. You know, didn't they understand that that kind of open sin was a leavening process? And by leaven, it affected the whole congregation. You know, just look at our type in, uh, uh, you know, in the, there was a really zealous effort to exp expend it to pur purge all leaven from the household you know, why weren't the Corinthians, the church at Corinth, why, why was the church not doing that? Why did God have Israel purge leaven from their household? You know, there's nothing wrong with leaven. Except that it was a perfect illustration of sin. That's what sin does. You know, it, it reduces it. It, it, uh, it spreads a, a more broad, a more casual attitude towards sin and it reduces our understanding of the horror of sin i think to some extent all of us today are involved in that of uh, not truly appreciating what christ did so what about christ our passover we know what the type was the passover was an innocent lamb you know, and surely at least some kids must have asked, you know, well, why do we do this? Why does the innocent die for the guilty? Well, because there's no other way that God could forgive your sin. You couldn't pay the, the, the price. You, you could not pay that sin debt. And no one that you knew could pay the price for your sin. It was your loving Father who sacrificed Himself incarnate in your place. That was the price of sin. God became man and dwelt among us. For Christ, our Passover has been sacrificed, has been slain for us. That's what we're told right here. Verse 7. You people at Corinth you people in whatever city or country that you're in, uh, you people at Blessed Hope Forever, our Passover has already been sacrificed for us. And that is a, that's a tremendous difference than the type. The anti-type is a sacrifice once for all. Don't you care? Does it mean anything to you Corinthians that God Almighty, as the Son, left heaven's glory and bore the horror of the death that He went through, suffering the punishment of God Almighty for your sin. Does it mean nothing? Do we care? You Corinthians, purge out that old leaven that you might be what you are you are a new lump. Christ has been sacrificed for you. You're, you're a new lump. It says you may be a new lump, but that's what you are. As you are a new lump. There's no leaven in that new lump. There's, there is no sin in the new man. What's it doing in the body of believers at Corinth? Therefore, let us keep the feast. Let us keep the feast. And I want you to understand that, that most 
most commentators almost pass over that and some say well you know that's that's your fellowship with the lord that's what we're doing dearly beloved right now we are keeping that feast we are feasting on the word of god we're feasting on the body and the blood of the lord jesus christ you know sound sounded horrible you know when christ said to his disciples unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood you have no part in me sounds re sounded really awful they didn't understand what he was saying many were horrified at what he said and 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 some asked well how in how in the world can we do that folks we're doing it right now we are feasting on our lord jesus christ he the son of god was willing i'm going to suggest eager to be made flesh to take upon himself the form of a servant and be that passover lamb and it's done. It's done. Not as the Passover lamb, the type, but as the anti-type. It is a once-for-all sacrifice, not needed to be done, to be repeated year after year after year. Therefore, act as, as who you are. Act as unleavened. You are unleavened. And rejoice. Keep that feast. You are unleavened because Christ died in your place. I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators. I'm not going to spend a lot of time uh, on the discussions that exist on that verse. I have spent a little bit of time uh, and and I, I repeat myself in many videos, pushing that point, stressing the point. This is God's Word. It is not Paul's Word. Paul wrote it, but he didn't author it. There's a big difference between writing and authoring. Uh, we're not looking at Paul's reasoning, Paul's logic. Paul is being inspired, led, to be involved in the word which was God breathed to write what God wants written so when I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators when I wrote unto you in an epistle there there are those who uh, believe as I do that God is saying this and therefore everything Paul writes is inspired Uh, I believe that everything, everything, every single thing that Paul ever wrote was inspired. There are uh, lots of studies on the, the canonicity of Scripture, you know, the authority of Scripture. There's a lot of debates on that. And people, they'll give you reasons why it was, why it was canonized, why it was structured the way that it is. Uh, we know that they're not the scriptures are not the result of any particular decree of man. The scriptures are what God made them to be, uh, including the order, the arrangement of these books, because that's the the working of the Holy Spirit in God's people over the years. Uh, and so what was accepted as Scripture was, was not because, well, somebody decided, to, well, that ought to be Scripture, okay? You have a sovereign God behind all of this. It wasn't because some group of theologians got together and said, well, this is what we're going to call Scripture, you know, and, and, you know, and, and then this is what we're not going to call Scripture. <coughs> uh Luther didn't even like the epistle of James, but it stuck. But it didn't matter what Luther wanted. You know, why is it there? Because God worked in his people to accept this as scripture. 
So the Holy Spirit tells Paul to write this. And I think there's a good reason he did. This is God's Word. There was another epistle. And there are those who believe, uh, as I do, basically, that this, this epistle mentioned here is, uh, is something other than what we're studying. Now, the original text, the Greek text, is showing me a definite article here. I wrote to you in the epistle. Now, they argue that the epistle talked about is this one. Yet that doesn't make any sense. Uh, at least not to me, it doesn't. We haven't read any place with, with the possible, with the exception maybe of the beginning of this chapter, not to keep company with fornicators. So he says in verse 9, in verse 9 he says, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators. So it appears to me, and I'm going to suggest that he wrote them a letter that God did not include in the canon of Scripture. That's my position. Uh, you don't have to agree with that or anything else that you hear come out of my mouth. He did inspire that letter, but it wasn't included in Scripture. It wasn't included in the canon. Not that there was anything wrong with it, but that God did not include it in His Word. Uh, I think if he had included everything that, he, that God authored, you know, our Bibles would be about four times thicker than what they are. So the Holy Spirit has Paul write, I did write that, but not altogether with the fornicators of this world. Not altogether with the fornicators of this world. Verse 10. And I do not think God is saying it's okay to fellowship with the fornicators of this world. You know, to keep company uh, with them. That it's okay to associate with them in the same way that you associate with those in the church. But in that other letter that he wrote, he wasn't writing to them about the fornicators of this world. Because the next verse says, you know, by no means did I mean with the fornicators of this world, which, which, you know, to me sounds like he's saying that it's perfect. It sounds like it's saying it's perfectly okay to associate with the fornicators of this world. That's not what he's saying. He didn't say that. He did not say that. In my humble opinion, what he's saying here is that I didn't mean you were not to associate with the fornic uh, fornicators of this world for then you'd have to go out of the world the world the, uh, the, the world system the uh, the Holy Spirit is addressing this issue from the standpoint of a body context uh, he's concerned about what is going on inside the body of, of Christ here. and because We can't disassociate ourselves from those who are of the world. We cannot do that. I can't do that. You can't do that. No Christian can do that. Because to do that, we'd have to leave the world. Which is you know kind of what we want to do. But that's another subject. But when it comes to those who are within the church, well, that's a different story. That's an entirely different subject. Fornication, as well as the other sins mentioned, don't belong in the church, in the body of Christ. The church, His body, any body of believers, anywhere. Okay. <coughs> we do, to, to some degree, we have to associate with immoral people in the business world, uh, in our community, uh, in the, the, the city, the state, the country in which we live. The point is, 
We don't need to in the church. We don't need to inside the church, in the body of believers who meet together to what? To what? To feast on Jesus Christ. How do you feast on Jesus Christ? Realizing that in that feast he became, Christ became our Passover. He died in our place, and we're going to fellowship with immoral people in open sin, okay, inside the church. And now all of a sudden we have a problem. Leaven that we need to purge. Out. And folks, don't all of you sin. Please answer with a resounding yes, okay? All right? Is there one of you out there who says that he, do, he doesn't sin? You know that you sin. The old man doesn't do anything but sin. But in Christ, are we to conclude that since we all sin, well, we just, we might as well just, we might as well sin. Look at what it says. Purge out that old leaven. Well, how do we do that? How do we do that? I mean, look, let's just set about as our goal right now to purge out every one of you who has sin in your life. All okay? right, let's just do that. Let's do that right here on Blessed Hope Forever. All of you, everyone viewing this, we do that. There won't be anybody here. I can just, I can just go off. I can go. I don't know on vacation. All right, I can, I can go ride my horse. All right, folks, we can't do that. So what is God saying here? Purge out the old leaven, because you've been made a new lump. You are unleavened. Dearly beloved, God tells us to walk worthy of the vocation wherewith we are called. We are going to heaven because, and only because, Christ died in our place. It does not say purge out everyone that sins. Okay? If, that, if that's what it's saying, then I don't know what purge out means. The, the text is not saying that we are to physically throw them out. I don't believe that for a second. You might, you might, I don't. I think it means that we don't associate with them. We don't have fellowship with them. There's no fellowship with light, light between light and darkness. And so what, that's where we're at in our study in the fifth chapter. And in verses 9 and 10, We have to have some association with those in the world. Those who are not only immoral, but, uh, but covetous. You know, they're greedy for gain, regardless of what it means to anybody else. They're extortionists. You know, there are all kinds of things here. Uh, those who even use force to do it. They're idolaters. They worship things other than God. You know, it might be money, it might, it might be stocks, it might be bonds, it might be other things. You know, people worship all kinds of things nowadays. Anything to, to avoid worshiping God. But if, if you had no association with them at all, you'd have to leave the world. You'd have to go out of the world. You know, which, which likely won't be long from now. But in the meantime, we have this to deal with. But we'd have to leave the world. So I'm writing to you now to not associate with anybody who's called. Note that it says, who's called a brother. All right, it doesn't say he's a brother. He's called a brother. Now, he may be a brother. He may not be a brother. But the indication, for certain, the indication is that he's in the fellowship, okay? We are not to associate, to fellowship with this man who is called a brother if he be morally 
wrong, and I'm going to go as far as to say spiritually wrong. Well, Steve, what's the difference? I, I think I've talked about that. I think the indicator is both morally and spiritually wrong. He's in moral sin, and he's in spiritual sin. Dearly beloved, I would rather disassociate from one who has spiritual sin before one who has moral sin. Jesus ate with sinners. Uh, he didn't have much very good to say to the Pharisees. I'm not trying to excuse one or the other. I happen to think the spiritual is worse than the physical. Uh, the problem with the moral infidelity and, and evil is that it's more apparent than the spiritual. But I believe we should break fellowship with anyone, anyone, and I think it will be broke, broken, it, who is both spiritually or morally in open sin, boasting about it, bragging about it, not sorrowful about it. That's what it says. That's what we've seen in the context. You and you have to have some association with them in order to conduct your business, uh, to, to live your life. Okay? Uh, I've worked for many a, a boss, you know, who was living uh, in sin, open sin. But in the fellowship inside the church, in the fellowship of believers, it, it's not to our benefit, certainly not to our benefit, to associate with those who are living in open moral sin because leaven corrupts, okay? And those who are in spiritual immorality to, to some degree, uh, I, I early on in this, uh, or a few videos back, I talked about that. Uh, but they boast about their conquest, their con conquests, their activities, that, we don't associate with that kind of people. We just don't associate with, the, with that kind of people. Good company corrupts, bad company corrupts good morals, okay? And if we don't associate with them, they'll probably leave on their own, is what I suggested. They're not going to stick around. What fellowship does light have with darkness? But, it's, but we're not booting them out the door. As I suggested before, I do not believe the Corinthians were being told to remove these individuals with bodily, physical force. Okay? I don't believe that for one moment. All right? I have written to you, if any man called a brother, whether he is or not, God knows, he's called that, he's suspected of being a brother. If he's a fornicator, and again, that is, I believe, both moral and spiritual. There's spiritual fornication. It's articulated in the Greek, the fornication, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner with such a one, don't even eat with them. All right? Don't eat with them. All right? And that eat, to me, seems to refer to the Lord's Supper. And that's why people have taken that position. But, but listen, we just saw in verse 8, therefore keep the feast. Celebrate it constantly. Don't make an idol of it, but feast on the Lord Jesus Christ in the Word constantly. And folks, I believe that that eating is what we are doing right at this moment. That's what I believe. The Lord Jesus Christ is our Passover. He's already been slain. If we don't understand this, we miss the strength of the verse. You are unleavened. Live like it. You know, go back to verse 7. Purge out, therefore, the old leaven, that you may be a new lump. That, that you may be the new lump which you are, because Christ our Passover has been slain for us. So Christ is our Passover. 
His precious blood is that protection over the doorpost of our heart so that the vengeance of the Lord doesn't fall upon us. His judgment doesn't fall upon us because our, his, the judgment fell on Christ. What a wonderful thought. God's judgment against sin cannot fall on you because Christ is your Passover. He was slain for you. So judgment can't fall on you. So then why worry about it? Why purge it out? Well, you know, we're not purging one another out uh, left and right here. What we are purging out is that insidious idea that somehow what Christ did for us wasn't, was, was, not, was in, insignificant or it wasn't enough. And that idea that leads us to often treat sin so lightly because we don't realize the depths of the sinfulness from which we have been saved, redeemed. You know, not realizing who we truly are in Christ. Dearly beloved, we need to remind ourselves constantly that what gives sin its power, what gives sin its strength, is the law. The law. It is the grace of God that allows us to feast on Christ. Law only leads to the very sinful activities that the Holy Spirit is pointing out here. That He's, that he's point, brought to the surface here in this, in this chapter. And sin, whether moral or spiritual, it always results, always results from ignorance concerning what God has done for us in Christ. And there are, sadly, there are so many believers who are ignorant of what Christ has done for them. We're not looking at some lesson here whereby the body of Christ is to bite, bite and devour one another, okay? You know, love some of the brethren, and, but not, not others. You know, keep some, uh, get rid of others. But to purge ourselves from living as who we once were before we came to understand who we are in Christ. Which we do not to go to heaven, but because why? 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 Because we love Him. Because He told us to. Dearly beloved, do you have to walk worthy of, of your vocation in order to go to heaven? No, absolutely not. But it is your privilege to. Seeing you put on the new unleavened man, that's why we do it. Because He told us that He has set us apart for Himself. We saw that right at the beginning of the epistle. Therefore, we ought to act like what we are as new creations in Christ Jesus. I believe God was working in these believers at Corinth to will and to do of His good pleasure. That's what I believe, including the man uh, delivered over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh. I have no problem with him, God being sovereign here. I do, however, have a problem if we take that to mean that we can just, well, we can just sin in order that grace may abound. You know, that, that carries us over into licentiousness. You know, we as a group of believers ought to really try to not associate with people living in open sin, bragging about it, boasting about it, where it's commonly accepted, where it corrupts the entire body. In fact, I'll suggest that we can't, we can't really do that if eating means what I think it means. Feasting on Jesus Christ. Verse 12, For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within the, the church. And verse 13, But them that are Without God judges, therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. That wicked person. 
okay? Dearly beloved, you can't turn anywhere in this Bible and not see God's love and grace in all of this. I love you all, I truly do, and I pray for you constantly. I'm well aware of what's going on in the world. We're certainly living in perilous times. I do believe our Lord is coming soon. Until then, rest in Him. Rest in Him. Rest in His love for you. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.